Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Claire Kim, your MC for today's lecture. Uh, it is my great pleasure and truly appreciate your attendance on a happy rainy day. And actually, this is the, uh, it's been three years from the last Sukhetes Karina in offline meeting. So over the three years, we have been many various trials to upload YouTube videos and making a, a lot of um, inviting talented and deeply insighted lecturers to Socrates Karina in online. And today we finally kicked off the offline meeting in th three years. So I'm so impressed by your attendance, especially. All right, um, this is the 91st <laughs> Socrates Karina lecture meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Hyungna Oh, the professor at Gyeonggi University, who is going to give us an insightful lecture titled Climate Change and ESG Management. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce Professor, professor Oh. She obtained her doctoral degree at Cornell University in 2003, and she's currently a professor of economics, College of International Studies in Gyeonggi University over four years. Also, her specialized research of climate change, energy economics, applied micro, trust and behavioral economics have been widely known to many renowned domestic and international journals and media. Especially for today's lecture, she will deliver her insights on climate risk, green finance, and ESG management. Without further delay, please welcome Professor Hyung Na Oh with a long round of applause. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm very honored to speak about uh, today's topic, the climate change and ESG management uh, in general and some specifically in Korea. First, uh, let me describe the current status of climate change. Uh, before we start the global warming, uh, let me explain what the ecosystem or the Earth system is doing for us. Our planet, the Earth, provides a life support system for many different forms of life, uh, but there are some many signs that something is wrong. And one of the prominent evidence that the ecosystem is in trouble is a global warming. As you can see, uh, the temperatures across the planet are now higher than they have been for thousands of years. And uh, here is a temperature series from the Arctic showing a steady cooling trend over the last 10, uh, last 10 years, uh, well, 10,000 years actually, this is 10,000 years, and suddenly it reversed with a sharp warming trend over the last century. And uh, actually the worst uh, Earth system services are quite bearing. Uh, it includes, uh, it, it provides a fertile soils and upwelling of the ocean circulation that brings nutrients from the deep ocean to support uh, the many of the marine ecosystem. And then the marine ecosystem provides a protein rich food to uh, human beings. And storage carbon through the dissolving the atmosphere carbon dioxide into the ocean is also part of a larger earth system uh, regulatory service. Uh, again, uh, we are now the epoch of Holocene, and the, this epoch, the Holocene, has proved to be the most accommodating for the development of human civilization. And uh, before the Holocene, there was a very long time period uh, when the temperature is, was unpredictable and, uh, and temperature fluctuated a lot. And, uh, uh, under this situation, uh, humans cannot settle down and develop the, the uh, kind of civilization. And uh, after this vulnerable period, we have a Holocene. And uh, as you can see, uh, during the Holocene period, the, uh, the, late, the temperature was quite stabilized. And under this situation, the, the human beings can do uh, something, like uh, including farming, or the, uh, the, the basically civilization, and we can develop the cities. And now, uh, 
the, uh, the scientists uh, argued that by the end of this century, mean global surface, surface temperature is expected to rise by 0.3 degrees Celsius to 4.8 I mean degrees Celsius relative to uh, pre-industrialization period average. Uh, but right now, though, uh, no one is expecting 0.3 uh, degrees Celsius change. Uh, and more warming is expected for a higher level of greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, this is a closer period. And again, this is the temperature uh, has been quite uh, stable here. And we are around the end of Holose and after that period, and we have a very like a, the uh, large range of uh, the, uh, the temperature change uh, after the Holose period. And this is the end of 2200. So uh, as you can see, the expected temperature change, if we don't do anything, which is called as a business as usual, and the temperature uh, change will be uh, a little bit more than five, but less than 10. But as you can see, there is more than 10 degrees Celsius change. Uh, this is kind of a range, right? So, uh, so even though we predict this level, but uh, our prediction is not perfect. So it is possible to have a really, really like a, the high uh, climate change uh, compared to the pre-industrialization level. Uh, which means the uh, the period between 1985, uh, it's not 86, 85 to uh, 2000, but uh, this in this statistics, they use the, the base year for this uh, time period. And again, the range of price change, I mean, the, the temperature change uh, expected by uh, scientists are quite varying and the driver to make a big difference here is the, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we are going to emit uh, today and the future. And uh, this is the recent report from IPCC. IPCC means the International Panel on Climate Change. Uh, this is the, the scientist channel uh, the, uh, related to, I mean, uh, they are focusing on the climate change and uh, the, there are five scenarios, and the after SSP, there are some different numbers, and this one shows these numbers correspond to the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions we, we are going to emit from now to the future. And uh, when the number is large, then it is corresponding to the business as usual scenario. So as we continue to uh, continue the current uh, the emitting behavior, then uh, by 2030, the temperature change will be 1.6. And if we do my, our best, this is corresponding to the net zero scenario. Uh, uh, and then the temperature change by 2030 is 1.5. And you can see that even though the range is uh, uh, bearing, but they are kind of average uh, similar to each other. And uh, up to today, the global temperature change compared to the, the pre-industrialization uh, average is about 1.09 degrees Celsius. And as you can see today, uh, the density and the frequency of extreme weather event is, dub uh, is doubled compared to the base year, again, the pre-industrialization period. Uh, when, I mean, but the relationship between the temperature change and the density or uh, the frequency of extreme e uh, event is not linear. It is like an exponential. So uh, when the temperature change is about one degree Celsius, we have uh, twice of the, uh, the extreme weather event we had uh, before, and also the density of those events is, is, is doubled. And, but, when the additional 0.5 degrees Celsius change uh, occurs in the future, then uh, the frequency and the density of uh, extreme weather events will be uh, twice of the current level. That means compared to the pre-industrialization period average, it will be four times. Right? So density and, I mean, uh, both density and uh, frequency uh, will be the four times of the pre-industrialization period average. So it is pretty severe. And 
And again, uh, even though uh, we implement the net zero strategy, the expected uh, temperature change is already 1.5 degrees Celsius in 2030. Uh, and if we, again, the, when we talk about uh, net zero, and uh, that means that the, the target temperature change is 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that change is talking about the, by end, the temperature change uh, in the end of this century. So uh, if we uh, are on the path of net zero, then temperature change in 2050 will be 1.6. And then uh, it like a, a little increment can be found here, but after that, then uh, the temperature will fall. So by the end of this century, we can wrap the temperature change within 1.5 degrees Celsius. If and only if when we follow this track. Otherwise, the temperature change is a lot, like a larger than uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. So if we uh, continue the, uh, the current uh, production behavior or the consumption behavior, the expected temperature change will be 4.4 uh, degrees Celsius by the end of this century. Then you can imagine that the density or the frequency of extreme uh, weather events here. And this one shows the example of uh, the uh, extreme weather events uh, according to uh, five scenarios. And uh, again, the BAU means that no mitigation actions uh, are not going to be implemented. Then the number of people exposed to flood will be uh, over than uh, 100,000. I think this, this is a million, 100, uh, 100 million. Uh, more than 100 million, but if we are on the net zero uh, strategy or uh, pathway, then uh, the number of people exposed to flood will be a little bit uh, larger than before, but uh, it will be, uh, the number can be under control. Okay. And what are the impacts of climate change? And this figure shows the projected changes in yearly average temperature and uh, yearly average temperature. And as you can see, uh, the, the, there are some dark, uh, dark LED and that is corresponding to over four degrees Celsius change. And uh, even that uh, big change uh, is observed the northern part of the Earth. Uh, this figure shows the changes in precipitation and in general the precipitation is expected to increase in some uh, high uh, latitude, uh, equator, Pacific Ocean and monsoon regions uh, where the Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific region is uh, included. Right? And as you can see uh, today, uh, the precipitation is expected to increase almost every place. But the frequency and the density of uh, drought uh, is also expected to increase. That means uh, we have some uh, a little bit long dry season and we have a little bit long and uh, long rainy season and the density of a flood is expected to increase in the future. And the second effect will be the sea level rise and uh, under that situation, some small island economies uh, will be in trouble because they will lose their uh, homeland. And uh, there will be some secondary effect of climate change. So as we can see, the, uh, the, when the temperature uh, is, uh, increases, then uh, there will be some adverse uh, the climate damages. Uh, we will have uh, some uh, the very uh, severe natural disasters and uh, rising sea level also cause some problem and uh, resources becomes very uh, uh, not, not abundant. The most important problem is the food, is the food. So uh, when the temperature change is mild, then some plants uh, will grow much faster, including rice. But uh, wheat 
uh, is in trouble, but uh, wheat and uh, rice uh, production can be compensated with each other. But when the temperature change is severe, then uh, most of the plants uh, which are used as food uh, will, be, will be less produced. And uh, the ecosystem, Earth's, Earth's surface does not uh, function pretty well. So the, the ocean does not provide enough uh, protein to human beings. Then that means the amount of food available uh, for human beings will be uh, smaller than before. And uh, from the history, we observed that when we have some lack of food, then the food price uh, will increase. Then there will be uh, lots of troubles, including terrors and uh, the uh, armed conflicts. And uh, when people lose food or their homeland, then they will migrate and they become a kind of a, a climate change or the disaster, I mean, the refugees uh, related to uh, climate, right? So, and uh, when they move to other country, then uh, when it combined with some uh, bad uh, governance, the, uh, the political regime problem, then uh, we will observe political instability and the social fragmentation and economic uh, instability. So uh, when uh, inappropriate response is added, then there will be some uh, bad events. And then uh, this, under this situation, the uh, opportunity uh, for organizing uh, violence will increase. Right? And, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, the risk of armed conflict uh, will increase. Uh, according to one uh, UN organization's report, the Asia-Pacific region is, uh, is known to be very vulnerable to conflicts. Uh, the regions uh, are described here. The Asia-Pacific region is a home to half of the world's total population and two-thirds of the world poor with 1.8 billion living on less than two US dollars per day. Uh, those living in the region are also four times more likely to be affected by natural disasters than people living in Africa. We thought that Asia is better than Africa, but in terms of natural disaster, uh, it is not true anymore. Uh, Definitely, it is worse. Uh, the our situation is worse than uh, that of the Europe or uh, North America. So, uh, UNEP concluded that the Asia Pacific is also uh, uh, very vulnerable to conflicts. And uh, recently, we have two risk, two fatal risk, and one of them is the pandemic, and the other one is uh, the uh, climate change. But uh, according to the Harvard uh, study, uh, the, they have the common roots. In agriculture, cities, deforestation, burning fossil fuels, everything here is related to civilization, right? And this civilization heats up the earth, and living things should migrate. And uh, I don't know whether you know about the story of uh, Tol, uh, uh, which is, that is a Korean name, uh, it is the plants in icing age. And when the temperature, uh, I mean, when the earth uh, became a little warmer than before, that, uh, I mean, uh, it's getting cold, the dol mehanamu is a really uh, small uh, tree and it migrate, migrate. Uh, from the Arctic area to Jeju Island. And at the time, the Korean Peninsula is linked to Jeju Island, so the, the plants uh, successfully migrate to Jeju Island. And now the temperature has increased over time, including I mean, in Jeju too. And as a result, the dead uh, plants uh, moved to the top of Hala Mountain. So when uh, additional temperature change occur, then uh, dead plants will uh, disappear. So that is called as a, a type of uh, the biodiversity loss, right? And like this, uh, not only the plants, but also animals should move uh, when uh, the, the earth heats up, 
then uh, people also move to animals because, because of uh, the development, right? And then uh, interactions and the chance of transmission of virus increase. And so uh, according to the IPCC, uh, the, the AR6 reports, uh, pandemic was not uh, included in the impacts of climate change, but uh, the scientists agreed that the pandemic will be included in the impacts of climate change in the following uh, reports. So uh, the frequencies of a new pandemic is now three years, but the, the duration, I mean, the, the interval is getting shorter and shorter. So uh, again, the uh, climate change and the pandemic and the, uh, air pollution is another uh, outcome, but all of these three have the same roots. That is the human's uh, activities. And this one shows uh, the, uh, what happens if the global temperature increases by uh, one degree Celsius, two degrees Celsius, and three de degrees Celsius, and more than four degrees Celsius. And at the beginning, uh, there are some uh, lead, I mean, the uh, green or yellow, that means the, the impact is mild or even beneficial. But when the temperature change exceeds three degrees Celsius and uh, everything looks like a, a dark lead, that means uh, the food, water, ecosystem, and extreme weather events and the, uh, the irreversible change, I mean, the, like, uh, the, bad, the probability of having these bad events uh, will increase. Okay. And, um, for last two or three years, we observed that uh, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions uh, per year uh, declined due to the pandemic, right? But uh, we cannot be uh, optimistic because the, uh, the previous uh, events or the history of greenhouse gas emissions shows that uh, after the crisis, the, the pattern of uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, came back to the normal. So uh, even there are five, I mean, even though uh, there are five uh, very serious economic crises, but it, it looks like a linear line. That means the impacts of a pandemic is really uh, temporary. And what are the impacts in Korea? And we uh, experienced uh, uh, we have experienced the frequent extreme weather events and natural disasters, and the uh, annual pre precipitation of six major cities increased by 19% in uh, 100 years. And rainfall intensity is doubled compared to that of the 1970s, and the frequent of drought and intensified typhoons and frequency of heavy snow has increased over time. So the Korea is not an exception, and uh, we experienced the heat wave during the summer, and we have experienced the warm winter, but the heavy snow, uh, that does not mean that the, uh, we don't have any uh, heavy snow. And we have uh, very beautiful four seasons, but now the, the distinction among the seasons is not clear. So uh, my favorite season is four, but uh, the the four is really short nowadays. And uh, so again, uh, the five uh, scenarios uh, corresponds to the each at the uh, level of, different level of greenhouse gas emissions or concentrations of CO2 and atmosphere. And, uh, and now the International Society is targeting 1.5 degrees Celsius target and which corresponds to uh, this certain level of uh, the CO2 emissions. And uh, this level is called as a net zero. And net zero means that uh, net zero is, I mean, net emission is computed uh, by the following formula. So total amount of uh, greenhouse gas emission minus the, the amount of emission observed by trees or oceans. So uh, there are two ways to achieve net zero. One is to reduce the, the level of greenhouse gas emission, and the other one is 
to uh, increase the capacity to observe uh, the emitted CO2 by planting uh, the trees or but we cannot control oceans, so maybe the planting trees will capture uh, the CO2 from atmosphere by using direct air capture technology. I mean, there are very limited methodology to uh, reduce the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions by capturing or by observing uh, the, the emissions, right? So the first option uh, will be preferred. The first option is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And then uh, the, uh, there was uh, the uh, study conducted by IMF, and the IMF compared the, the people's preferences or perception on the, the, uh, the climate change crisis and uh, their responses to the current uh, crisis. And uh, IMF and also the uh, Edelman Trust the Barometer, uh, which I'm going to explain here, uh, says that after the pandemic, people are concerned about climate change uh, more than before. And uh, they showed more willingness to respond to the climate change. Right? And uh, Edelman's uh, trust barometer is, one, is similar uh, to the IMF uh, the study. Uh, Edelman trust barometer surveyed the people's preferences or uh, opinion uh, on the, the special, I mean, the, some important issues every year. And uh, the, their, uh, their survey outcome in 2020 showed a really different trend, uh, uh, which is really different from uh, the people's perception or this, uh, attitude toward the, the capitalism before, I mean, in the past. So, uh, Capitalism was considered as the single great, greatest in, uh, invention in human history because uh, it solved the, the problem of food or uh, the economic wealth, right? Due to the capitalism, we can enjoy uh, like lots of commodities and services and our convenient life is also the outcome of capitalism. But now the capitalism is uh, on the table of, uh, uh, like uh, the people concerned about, and uh, and this four also showed the, the changes. And previously, when this question was asked, the proportion of people uh, who agreed on this argument was really uh, limited. But now, uh, let's see the proportion of uh, respondent who agreed on this argument. First one is. The system, the system is capitalism. Capitalism is working for me, uh, only 18%. Capitalism, I mean, uh, I'm not sure, uh, or uh, I don't think that the, uh, the capitalism is serving for us. And uh, the proportion is, uh, the, the, uh, is, is not uh, very prominent. And if you look at this, and uh, the capitalism is injustice. 74% of respondents agreed on this opinion. And uh, we need some change. Uh, the proportion of uh, the uh, respondents who agreed on this is uh, 73 percent, and I have uh, I don't have any confidence on capitalism. The proportion uh, of agree uh, the, the the respondents agreed on this argument is 66 percent. But still, the proportion of people who who agreed that there is no hope in capitalism is only 26 percent. That means people uh, perceive that the capitalism is capitalism matters at this moment, but there is a hope, right? And uh, and again, the 56 uh, percent of respondents says that the capitalism, as it, it existed today, does more harm than good in the world. So we need some change. And uh, the ESG is known as uh, the 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 uh, paradigm shift in the management sector. And that paradigm shift means that from shareholders' capitalism to ca stakeholders' capitalism. So what does the stakeholders' capitalism mean? So that uh, this, this figure is going to explain the, uh, the underlying uh, perception of, of the public to support the stakeholders' capitalism. 
And it is currently expected for a firm to demonstrate good intention toward the stakeholders and indicate a clear and long-term plan that meets the stakeholders' expectation, not shareholders. So uh, this one shows that the percent who ranked each group as most important uh, in determining the long-term uh, uh, profit, uh, only 13 percent of respondents says that shareholders. And the others, 87 percent, says that the uh, employees, customers, and communities, including global community, are the determinant of uh, part uh, to determine, I mean, uh, for the company's long-term profit. And all of these three, employees, customers, or the global communities, or local communities, are, are the stakeholders of the company. So, uh, and also the 70% uh, of respondents says that a company can take actions both that both increase profit and improve the conditions in communities where they operate. That means uh, a company can take actions that both increase the interest of shareholders and interest of stakeholders. So that is the basics of uh, stakeholders capitalism. And uh, there is another uh, field, another school of uh, study, uh, which is called as a donut economy, which was framed by Kate Rayworth, uh, the, a, a young uh, economist in, in the UK. And she argued that uh, we needed to go into the donut. Uh, actually, this is really donut. And outside the donut means that we produce too much and we consume too much. As a result, the environment damage will increase. And inside the donut means that, I mean, uh, not inside, but inside of this, uh, this boundary is the short pole. So uh, if we produce uh, too less, then the poverty problem will occur. And also, it, it doesn't match with the sustainable development. So we need a proper level of consumption. We need a proper level of consideration for, uh, for, the, uh, kind of a, for the poor or the vulnerable uh, citizens, right? So uh, the actions from the government sector is, uh, is called as a Green New Deal. So the government response to this request will be the Green New Deal. And the private firm's response will be the ESG management. And this one shows the time frame, how uh, the ESG management has evolved. And in 2015, uh, Paris Agreement was uh, the, uh, the agreed. And, uh, and then at the time, uh, there, are few, there were few firms uh, which claimed the the uh, net zero, I mean, at the time, the net zero emission was not a, a, a famous uh, terminology. Uh, so the some firms argue that we are going to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, during 2015 to 2020, that means after the Paris Agreement, uh, after, like uh, during, the during five years after the Paris Agreement, only 3% uh, firms have reduced the greenhouse gas emissions by more than 8%. That means even though the pledge uh, has been made, but the outcome was not uh, successful, I mean, significant. And then uh, about three years later, the IPCC 1.5 degree Celsius reports was revealed to the public. And uh, in, in the Paris Agreements, uh, two, like, uh, they said, the Paris Agreement says that we need to target two degrees Celsius temperature change by the end of this century, uh, preferably uh, less than 1.5 degrees Celsius change. But after this report, 1.5 degrees Celsius target was uh, becomes the uh, kind of official target that the global society is pursuing. And uh, after uh, this report, the, there are uh, the pledges from um, the government in most advanced economies, including the, uh, the, U the USA's Green New Deal in 2019, and after the EU uh, Green Deal uh, in 2019. 
But after that, the pandemic uh, has occurred. So at the time, there was expected that the Green New Deal in the, U in the EU will be postponed. User in general, when uh, the economic crisis occur, occurs, then uh, some progressive actions uh, tends to be delayed. But uh, outcome was the opposite. So EU uh, published a little bit, uh, I mean, the strengthened the Green New Deal plan uh, the, after the pandemic. And after that, the China uh, purchased 2016 net zero, and uh, Japan and Korea followed that pledge, the net zero pledge. And around here, global firms perceive the climate change as a real risk, and globally, 8 to 10 percent annual reduction is required to reach the net zero goal by 2050. And uh, at the time, at the time is in 2020, only 32 percent of firms have declared to join net zero. But now, the number of firms uh, who uh, claims net zero has increased very fast. So now the number of firms uh, is, uh, I believe, it is over three, uh, over seven hundred at this moment. And uh, which caused the uh, which cause the changes into ESG management? Uh, the most, imp uh, I think, the most important driver will be the climate risk, and. Uh, regulatory landscape, uh, changes in regulatory landscape will be the second driver. And uh, uh, given the time constraint, I'm going to skip the Paris agreements and uh, I, I, will, uh, I will go to the Green New Deal directly. The Green New Deal uh, has appeared in academia and policy debates since at least the 1990s, but uh, it became the, the, uh, it became into the mainstream in 2007 by a uh, New York Times columnist, Thomas Friedman. And he says that we have two fatal risk crises, and one of them is economic crisis, recession, and the other one is climate change. And he says that we need one solution to two problems, and that is green code. And that green code is named by him as like a Green New Deal. And, but uh, I mean, after his, uh, after, uh, his announcement, I mean, his, uh, the column, the uh, ex-president Obama adopted that idea and uh, used, that, uh, used this idea uh, when he make some, uh, made some stimulate package uh, after the, room, uh, the, uh, like, uh, the financial crisis in uh, 2007 or 8, around that time, right? But uh, in 2020, uh, there was a G20 meeting in Toronto, and uh, G20 uh, leaders says that we will keep distance from the Keynesian economics. Keynesian economics is a theoretical background uh, for the Green New Deal, because Keynesian economics says that by expanding uh, government expenditure, we can uh, recover the uh, high uh, GDP growth rates, right? But uh, the G20 leader says that uh, that idea is not good. So uh, as the G20 meeting uh, declares that the, the distance from, I mean, departure from Keynesian economics, the uh, Green New Deal version one uh, ended. And Green New Deal uh, version 2.0 comes later and uh, it, it includes some social issues. Uh, Green New Deal 1.0 mentioned about the economic problem and some environmental problems. But in uh, Green New Deal uh, 2.0, the social issues are, are heavily stressed. One of the reasons is that the second version uh, was delivered as a grassroots movement progressive politi uh, politicians and think tank and NGOs. And I think this is, uh, this is one of the reasons uh, the second version of a Green New Deal includes some social issues, like uh, the, the in, uh, solving some inequality issues, those kind of things. 
And uh, the, whenever the Green New Deal uh, policy is implemented, and they usually uh, declare the green taxonomy. Green taxonomy identifies which one is, which technology is green, which uh, project is green, right? And even though the companies or investment investors want, want to invest on green project, they don't know which one is green and which one is brown, right? So uh, in general, the outcome of uh, investment project, pr project uh, will appear uh, like a 10 or at least the, the five years later from the, begin the, the investment uh, period of investment, right? That means uh, there is some uncertainty, right? But uh, as the government on a, the identified which, which technology is green, then uh, the uncertainty associated with the green technology uh, disappears. I mean, not perfectly disappeared, but uh, partially disappeared. So that's why the green taxonomy is important. So whenever, I mean, when the company uh, wants to uh, issue the green bond or conduct a green project, the company or investor uh, are required to check the green uh, taxonomy. So otherwise, they cannot get the loans from the bank with a good condition, or they cannot raise a fund from the financial market by using green bond or uh, green uh, Green uh, Equity Fund. And uh, what is ESG? ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. So for the environmental pillar, the pollution, definitely climate change, and or biodiversity impacts, uh, uh, natural resources use, those issues are included in uh, environmental pillar. So. Uh, when a company uh, does some kind of a business, uh, the, they need to evaluate the impacts of their uh, business activities on those issues. And then they need to report that outcome or the intention in their ESG report every year. So the uh, ESG report is kind of a communication channel between companies and investors or the public or the government regulators. So uh, if you look at the issues uh, in the environmental pillar, not only the climate-related issues, but also the other environmental issues that are uh, included. And social issues, social pillar, include uh, health or safety issue or diversity or inclusion, and even the, the data privacy issue is included in S pillar. And for the uh, G pillar, uh, it deals with the governance structure. Uh, and for example, when a company is really uh, like a, a when a, I mean, for example, when a company has a, the ESG committee or climate change risk uh, management committee in their board, then uh, the uh, outside uh, assess, assessing companies, including investor, can. Uh, can uh, predict that uh, this company, uh, this company's outcome, uh, uh, does not uh, put huge damage on environment in the future. So even though the current portfolio of the company is not really green, then uh, uh, the outside investors can um, expect, or uh, I mean, can have some hope for the company. Right? when there is some green component in governance. So these are three pillars, and they says that uh, the, I mean, uh, the, these kind of uh, the issues will, will be transformed into uh, metrics, and, uh, and so there will be some uh, the, the multiple indicators or data points to measure the company's uh, features on these issues. And then the aggregated uh, weighted average will be will construct uh, E pillar score and S pillar score and G pillar score. And again, the weighted average of these three uh, pillars will determine the overall ESG score of the firm. So that means that even though a company is good for some uh, indicators, but when this company is really bad, then the overall score 
it's not necessarily good because the assessing companies usually deal with the tail risk. So when a company is really good uh, for some aspect, it, it will increase the ESG score a, a little bit. But when a company is really bad in some areas, then if that area is really uh, important for the, the for the the industry that the company is in, then the total ESG score will be uh, reduced a lot. The reason is that uh, when a company is doing really bad, and nowadays everybody uh, owns uh, the, the, uh, the cellular phones, that means everybody works as a journalist. So there is no way to hide the wrong doings of the company. So that bad thing will be spread to the public and the firm's reputation will drop very dramatically. And even the company can have the lawsuit. Then the brand value of the company will be damaged and then it will link it to the financial loss of the company in the future. So the investors should care about that situation, right? So uh, when you look at the, the uh, I mean, uh, one, one more thing I need to add is that uh, I said that the, uh, the data privacy, privacy or the, the protection of privacy is one of the S fila, and it is important for the financial companies, but not the mining companies, right? So depending on industries where the company is in, some indicators are excluded, and some indi indicators, uh, I mean, big weight will be assigned uh, to some indicators when that indicator is really important. And compared to the sustainability, ESG is usually linked to the financial outcome of the company. So when an, uh, one uh, feature of the company has a potential to damage on the, uh, the company's financial outcome, then that uh, factor will be uh, highly evaluated in ESG uh, scoring. So, so uh, the, again, the ESG factors uh, vary, varies across evaluating companies. So, uh, but there are some common factors here. So, uh, one of the common factors is that, again, ESG deals with some uh, non-financial issues like uh, climate change or justice or how, they hand, how the company handles the employees. Uh, how they how the company educate their employees something like this that means non-financial uh, factors are taken into account in under ESG and there are some uncertainties to uh, the, about the impact because some impacts has no impact today for example even though I emit uh, 10 tons of CO2 today there is no change uh, today but uh, if I do it uh, for a long time, or uh, the, like a, the impacts, the, the CO2 I emitted today will be uh, in the atmosphere for more than uh, 100 years, right? That means the long run effect will be huge. So uh, that is actually a problem uh, faced by assessing company. And uh, the negative externality, like uh, pollution and health problems, are heavily uh, concerned in the ESG because those are the, the issues uh, that uh, public are concerned about much. And uh, the ESG uh, cares about the, the direct impact of the company's action. And in, addi I mean, in addition, the ESG also cares about uh, the company's interaction with the partner companies uh, that are located on the same value chain. Right? So you may have heard that the Tesla requested uh, LG chemical to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by conducting, I mean, by joining RE100, right? The reason is that the, R, the LG chemi chemical provides battery to uh, Tesla. So, Tesla wants to claim uh, we, are, we are pursuing net zero and we achieve net zero, right? And in order to do that, they need to reduce the, their own emission and also the emission from electricity and also the emissions from all of uh, partners located on the same value chain. So uh, that means even though the Korea is a little bit 
behind uh, of the, the climate change activities, but the global buyers requested the changes, the new I mean, green transition in the production sector. Okay. And these are the ESG factors or indicators. And again, they, I said that they, uh, there are some privacy and data security issue, and there are lots of carbon-related indicators and the board and ownership and corruption and tax transparency, those are the indicators listed under the G-pillar. So let me skip this and um, yeah, I don't, I think I already captured this. And uh, the, I said the global buyers uh, changed it I mean, global uh, the global buyers requested uh, the transition or the changes in production behavior uh, uh, to the partner companies. And also the investors uh, changed the, the, the criteria, investment criteria. BlackRock, the largest asset management company in the world, says that we are going to use the sustainability as a criteria in determining our investment. So uh, they said that we are going to post some list of companies or industries uh, when, the, when they uh, do uh, really bad on climate change. So when uh, a company's name is included in that list, then the company uh, has, some, has a big uh, like a challenge in uh, the raising fund, right? So this is a really big change. And uh, again, the ESG becomes a standard for uh, investment. Yeah. Again, I'm going to skip this. And uh, right now, the uh, more than 132 countries practice net zero, and the proportion of emissions and greenhouse, uh, like again, the seven more than 700 firms also uh, practice net zero, and most of conglomerates, large firms, and most of Korean conglomerates. Uh, also included in this category, even though they didn't, did, they didn't set the target year. So uh, as a result, uh, the Korean companies, uh, most of the Korean companies are not included in this number, sorry. Uh, they pledged the net zero, but they don't set the target year. Then uh, they are not included in this number. And a proportion of emissions and uh, GDP and population under net zero entities uh, is huge, right? So 83% for emission, 91% for GDP, and 80% for population. And uh, you can see uh, where loan firms are already practice net zero, and RE100, and Apple is one of them, and and Microsoft already achieved the uh, net zero and they are targeting net negative. That means they will emit a very small amount of greenhouse gas emission, but uh, by doing some offset uh, project, they will observe more greenhouse gas emissions than they emitted. Then they can claim uh, carbon negative. And they, uh, they are pursuing carbon negative by 2030. And Microsoft says that our action is based on principle, and uh, most of the principles are related to uh, climate change. So this, uh, these examples show that the, the climate change or uh, reduction, I mean, the, the mitigation actions uh, are located at the center of ESG management. And again, uh, these are the list of Korean companies which have practiced my, uh, the mitigation actions. But as you can see, uh, the, 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 like a target year uh, has not, I mean, for some companies, target year is not set yet. But you can see that most of uh, Korean conglomerates, uh, I mean, they practice uh, natural actions. And uh, ESG management was not very popular in Asia, but uh, now that there was a change in regulate, regulatory landscape because the China, Korea, and Japan uh, uh, 
the, uh, the, the governments in those three countries uh, conducted, have conducted the Green New Deal and also the global buyers requested net zero actions from uh, companies located in Asian countries. So uh, the, the uh, ESG management becomes uh, very popular in, uh, in uh, Asia. So uh, the last two slides shows the examples of the, uh, the KESG, Korean ESG. Uh, the financial sectors, including uh, the KB Financial Group or Shinan Financial Group, have acknowledged that climate change is a key to manage business risk and have been actively involved in climate financing. Uh, the recent statistics shows that when the company doesn't care the E filler, then uh, the company's probability to have a that the fines or bad financial outcome is large. So there is a financial motivation for the company to monitor or the, uh, manage the e-risk. And it is notice, uh, there is a noticeable uh, move. The South Korea's National uh, Pension Fund, that is one of the largest, uh, the world uh, third largest pension fund and it says that we are going to divest from coal fire plants. And uh, manufacturing companies are also involved in, I mean, started to join the net zero movement. And uh, their, their actions are a little bit, I mean, uh, like a later than uh, Western companies mm -hmm. does. But uh, SK and Samsung and Hyundai and POSCO, they also decide to participate in uh, hydrogen energy project and some uh, decarbonization activities. And these are the company list and their commitment. And that is the end of my uh, story. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Wow. <laughs> We've learned a lot, right? <laughs> All right, thank you again for your informative and insightful speech. All right, I think it's now time to wrap up this uh, lecture with Professor O. Oh, so please give her another, another big round of applause. Thank, Thank you for hearing. This is the end of today's meeting of 91st of Caltech's Korea Now. I'd like to thank all of you for being with us today and also extend my gratitude to the staff of the Academy of Korean Studies who have contributed to make this meaningful lecture. We hope to see you all again in August. Now let us open the banquet for your dining pleasure. Please enjoy the rest of the evening. This has been Claire Kim. Thank you. Thank you.